So good morning, Loft. How's everyone doing today? Um, it's awesome to see you all. Uh, for, those of you that, for those of you that may not know me, uh, my name is Sean. And I'm one of the youth pastors here. And um, Sam has so graciously asked me to fill in for him while he's away. So over the last couple of weeks, I had been talking to Sam about these ideas that I was having for the sermon. And every week I'd come to him with a new proposition, really excited. I'm like, oh, this idea has been formulating in my mind for a little bit. I'm really excited about it, and we'd hash out the details, and he'd give me some words of encouragement, and then a week later he'd ask me the same question, hey, how's sermon prep going? And I would come up with a, a new scripture verse, better than the last one, of course, and I'd be like, Sam, I'm really excited about this sermon that I got planned, and it's really something I've been thinking about for so long, the week that we hadn't discussed, and, um, and I'm really convicted right now. And he's like, oh, that's great, and he'd give me some word, words of encouragement, and the next week, the same thing would happen. And this happened for about two months. And uh, eventually, Sam started talking to me about how he remembers when he used to be like this. I don't know if I'm standing too close to another mic or something. No, you're good, you're good. Um, Sam remembers being like this. And now that he's a veteran pastor, it doesn't happen anymore. He's got a collection. But he would say, you know, it's harder when you don't have something like you're going through an entire book and you're just going to go through the process. It's harder trying to think of what you need to think of and, and, or think of a topic for one sermon at a time. And we would just laugh about that, and he would laugh way more than I would because it's not funny <laughs> to me. <laughs> so that prospect was interesting to me, how I could not land on one idea, and I started to ask myself why. Because last time I spoke, God gave me a message so clearly, and I knew what I wanted to talk about. It was a conviction that I had, and I was just like, this fits with what I'm feeling, and it fits with what I think Loft has to hear. And I was wondering why I wasn't getting that message this time. Why couldn't I make the decision? So I started to think, well, maybe it's because I'm a millennial. Millennials have a hard time decision-making, right? And um, while that might be true, I don't think it's the, I don't think it's the reason why. So our generation is not plagued any more than other generations with indecision. Um, to prove it, let's take a little poll of America right now. Um, McDonald's, Burger King, or Wendy's, what would you pick? <laughs> yeah, it's, the answer is none. It's what a burger. <laughs> You're all wrong. There's Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, texting, Instagram, or Insta, if you're a hipster. Kick, calling, WhatsApp, email, Skype, Flickr, Pinterest, LinkedIn. I don't even know if they have MySpace anymore, but there are so many ways to talk to people. What just happens to like face-to-face -face communication or simple calling? Why is it so complicated now? We have iPhones, Androids, Blackberries, Microsoft phones, and they all do the same thing. Android just does it a little bit better. Yeah. yeah, I got some fans on <laughs> um, It's pretty obvious that we have a lot of decisions right in front of us. Last year, there were over 700 big movies produced in Hollywood, and compare that to the early 90s, where there was only 400. We have so many food and restaurant options that uh, I did the math for you. If you ate 17, uh, 17 new restaurants, every single day, and you live to be 100 years old, you could actually eat at every restaurant, in America only, not in the world, in America. And if you're up for that challenge, meet me after sermon, and I will, I will uh, talk to you about that. <laughs> These decisions plague us every single day. There's so many options available to us, and we don't know what to do with them. So what happens when a real decision comes up? Not what phone you want or what upgraded plan you want, internet provider, but a real decision. Like, where should I work? Who should I get married to? Should I get married? Do we have kids? Life-altering decisions. So we're going to talk about indecision today. And before I do, um, let's just bow our head for a word of prayer. Father, you know what plagues our hearts. You know what our desires are. And Father, sometimes those desires are not the best. Sometimes we become selfish, and we just want 
what's dangling in front of us like a carrot and we chase it. But Father, these things aren't always the best for us and you do know what we truly need. And I ask that you would reveal those things to us. I pray that through the sermon we can be a bit more wiser as to how to approach the decisions of life and, um, and just how to approach our relationship with you. We love you and we thank you. Amen. Amen. So I'll invite you to turn with me to James uh, 1, 5 through 8. I think I have a little slide here. It says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives all generously and without reproach. And it will be given to him, but he must ask with faith and without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in his ways. Now that term double-minded is interesting because it only appears in the Bible two times, and it's only in James. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this happens. Um, for those of you that don't know, James was the brother of Jesus. And James, being the brother, you think, oh, you're the closest to Jesus, you ought to have trusted him since day one, but that's not the case. James had his doubts, and James did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after the resurrection. So I think James struggled with that decision-making process his whole life. The closest person to James was his brother, and he didn't believe. He had a tough decision to make. Now, being double-minded uh, literally means to have two minds. And in this context, it's talking about a mind focused on the world and a mind focused on spiritual things or God. Now, if we're dividing our attention between the world and God, we obviously can't merely be focused on God and His ways, can we? So we have a problem. Uh, James 1 8 you know, seven, just says he is a double minded man, unstable in his ways. So we went over what double minded means. Um, unstable in this context, the original word meant like to be staggered, like a drunk. We know. Most of you know that drunk people don't make the best decisions. Um, they're probably aimless, right? Going wherever the wind will take them. Whatever rush of emotion they have at the moment, that's what they go with. There's no decision-making process. It's, I want. Staggered like a drunk. Unstable. So this statement literally means that your attention is split and aimless. You'll have a tough time making decisions. So I wonder if James had the same fears or problems with decision-making as us, and no doubt he did. He was probably um, afraid of men, not like they would attack him, but their thoughts. Um, often we're told in the Bible to seek the wisdom, uh, the counsel of other people, but that doesn't mean that we should fall into the trap of people-pleasing. You can ask for wise counsel, but your actions need to be based off of wisdom or biblical counsel as well. It can't be based off of, oh, my best friend told me to do something. I want to make that person happy so we can remain friends. I'm going to do it. That's not wise. That's fearing your neighbors. Or maybe we're afraid to do what we want because of the opinion or attention of other people. Regardless, the end action is sinful and we're just pleasing the world instead of pleasing the will of God. Another thing that might have happened with James is that he was comfortable. Before Jesus came along, maybe James had a, a great life and he was not wanting to rock the boat, right? We get set in our ways, we turn on cruise control on the life, we go to work, we come home, we have our ribs that have been in the crock pot all day and they're awesome. Why rock the boat? Things are going well. Making decisions will change things in our life and we don't want to get splashed. It's easier to sit back and coast. And why make decisions that might ruin what's going on for us? It's much easier to make, uh, to not make a decision in light of possible negative outcomes. And I know sometimes it's frightening for us to change what's going on in our life. But that fear can be stifling and make you stagnant. And finally, a third fear that I think is very real for everybody, but specifically for Christians, is we think that we're going to miss the will of God if we make the wrong decision. 
And again, that's stifling. It, it holds us still thinking, if I do option A, and option B was in the will of God, I'm all of a sudden outside the will of God. And if you're sitting in that today, I want to encourage you um, and remind us that God is a lot bigger than any of us. And what you do will be done for the good, for the will of God. He's not going to be stumbled by our mistakes, so we use it for his better. So God is bigger than us. And it's easy to be afraid, but it can also be easy to become fearless. We make our decisions, and those decisions eventually make us, and they mold us into who we are. If we're constantly thinking and acting out of fear, then we will become a person that lives in fear, thus making more fearful decisions. But as you boldly trust God, you'll begin to take the shape of a bold person. Now, I'm not saying that bold decisions are easy. We're humans. We're going to fail. It's going to happen, and you're going to keep on doing it. I think it's easy to be afraid in our current society because we have instant notifications of what's going on in your life all the time. And our hyper-public lives often seem to need to be perfect. How easy is it to scroll on your phone and go, oh, this person, this guy, he's got an amazing car. Or this woman, she travels all over the place. What an amazing life she must have. But look at these guys. They, they, uh, they have a great relationship. Why can't I have that? When's the last time you posted something negative in your life happening? And even if you do that, what's the relationship of negative to positive? We like to put our best face forward, don't we? It's easy to look at other people's lives and think that they have it all together, but we don't. But it's no wonder that we live in fear, because we're surrounded by these options, we don't know what to do, and we're surrounded with this this face of everybody else is doing things right. And you only know the will and the mind of, of yourself, so you think, why can't I be on that level? So we have a problem in decision. The solution, James says, is uh, in, in 1, 5 through 6, it says that we need to admit if any of you lack wisdom, we need to admit that we don't have it. I highlighted if, it didn't come up there, but I highlighted if. I think that's a big point of the sentence, because if I ask you a question, you need to realize what you have innately inside of you, and that's what's happening here. If you lack the wisdom. Well, if you think that you have it, you're not going to respond in the way that I think you're going to. And it may be hard to, to admit that we don't have it, but I think even if you believe that you do, we need to realize the perspective of God. And if we only had that perspective, how much better off would we be? Clearly, none of us have that. So even if you think you have it, you're, we're, uh, we're less in some way. I think another reason that we are afraid to, to admit that we don't have wisdom is because we assimilate it with being smart. Um, we think that people who are smart are also therefore wise. There's a little illustration that I could uh, used to clarify this. When you think of someone wise, like picture right now, the wisest person, the wisest thing that you've ever seen or person in your life. And most of you are probably thinking Yoda. Right? Yoda is extremely wise. He leads all the Jedi. They come to him for counsel. But if you ever listen to him, his sentences are always backwards. He doesn't know plain English. Right? So he's not smart. And if you think of someone who's smart, you could think of Hermione Granger from Harry Potter. <laughs> really smart, right? Probably got all A's in her owls. I think that's what they're called, owls. Right? <laughs> and she's always in the library reading. That's like her go-to. But she chose wrong when Harry was clearly the better of the two. Not a wise move for Hermione Smart and wisdom. Obviously, they're not the same. So once we realize that we have a lack, we need to move on to step two. James 1.5 continues, and it says, let him ask God. It sounds trivial. It sounds easy and obvious. 
But I think a lot of times we get our advice from from faulty resources. We look towards our Facebook. We look towards Fox News. We look towards um, just really people that are not good sources of wisdom. And Dr. Phil, does he does he actually have anything to say that's like meaningful? He says, "Get real." What does that mean? What am I supposed to do with that, Dr. Phil? We're constantly fed with this stream of misinformation, but we put our trust in it. It doesn't work. Proverbs says, uh, 2.6, The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth came knowledge, came understanding. So who else are we supposed to turn to? A person who is knowledgeable, who is understanding of the universe. I think this kind of coincides with fearing and respecting the Lord. When you think about your Father in heaven, and you know that he's the creator, and you know that he knows and understands you and everything else in the world, why wouldn't we go to that as our source for wisdom? Now James continues, asking is not nearly enough. I think a lot of us ask, but we don't believe it's going to happen. So James 1, 6 continues and says, let him ask in faith with no doubting. The one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. In this sentence, what pops out to me is faith and doubting. A lot of times I think we ask and we don't actually believe we're going to get something. A lot of times we doubt what we're asking, or maybe we put it too much on us and we say, oh, maybe this is a selfish desire. Maybe this is not, again, what is in God's will. So. I'm not putting my heart into this question, I'm gonna do it because that's something that I do. Or maybe that's something that my uh, Christian circle of friends do. It just becomes rope, it doesn't become heartfelt. But James says that we need to believe in what we're asking. We need to believe. It reminds me of the story when Peter was walking out on the water with Jesus. Um, I think I have the text up here. It says, um, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it, is, uh, if it is you, command me, and I will come to the water. He, the reason that he doesn't know it's him is uh, it was dark, it might have been misty, and, he, and they, they see this thing standing on the water, and, um, and the guys, the disciples, yell out, it's a ghost. So they clearly didn't just go, oh, that's Jesus on the water, of course. They thought it was some mystical thing happening. But Peter has the courage to say, you know what, I think I know who this is. And he just asks one simple question. If it's you, say so, and I'll come out there. He's bold. He's courageous. He doesn't make a pros and cons list to walking on water. Obviously, that can't happen. He doesn't think about that. He just does it. He's bold. So it continues. It says, he, uh, Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, and he walked on the water and came to Jesus. Now, at this point, I'd be freaking out, like, dude, I'm walking on water right now. But he's, his eyes are on the prize. His eyes are focused on Jesus. So nothing else matters. He's not believing that what he's doing is impossible. He's not paying any attention. He's focusing on his Lord. But he saw the wind, and he was afraid. He began to sink out, and he cried, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Ye of little faith, why do you doubt? So Peter feels the effects of what's going on around him. He feels the wind, and all of a sudden he snaps back into consciousness, and he realizes what he's doing. And he begins to question where he's at. I'm not supposed to be standing on water. And he, he begins to have fear boil up inside of him. And that fear immediately is correlated with doubting what Jesus has allowed him to do. He becomes restricted because of his fear. He doubted, and like a wave of the sea, he was driven and tossed. Remember, we talked about being double-minded. When Peter started this interaction, he was single-minded. He was focused on godly things. He was focused on Jesus. But all of a sudden, the wind came in and changed things up for him, and he became double-minded because now his focus wasn't only on Jesus. All of a sudden, the physical, the worldly things around him began to muddle his understanding of what was going on. 
we became double-minded. Essentially, we can't desire the world and God at the same time. Um, Alistair Begg has a really cool anecdote about um, the wind and the sea tossing us around, so I'd like to share that with you. It goes like this. Um, a boy and his father are sitting on the coast, and the boy sees sailboats going in all different directions, some of them maybe in circles because they don't know what they're doing, and some going east and west. And He wonders how they can all be sailing in different directions because he knows that they're powered by the wind, and obviously they're sharing the same wind. And his father says, it's not the wind that's propelling them in their direction, it's the setting of the sails. And I wonder how prepared we are. I wonder how prepared we are, because life is going to throw wind at you. It's going to come from every direction. And if our sails aren't set, if our sails are not prepared to go towards God, where will we go? You'd be aimless, tossed about like the wind and the waves. We need to set our sails, you guys. We need to be in the Word. We need to be praying. We need to be asking with belief that it'll happen. To prepare yourselves. Now that's all good and dandy, right? We can believe that what we ask is going to happen. But really, practically, how does that work? How do I know that I can believe in God? Um, James will continue in 1.5c. Um, I don't have it in here, so I'm going to read it off here. It says, um, but if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives all generously and without reproach. And then it will be given. It doesn't say that God will grudgingly give it to you, or that if you ask hard enough, or if you ask enough times. It just says ask in faith, and it will be given generously and without reproach. Another word for generous could be liberally, because he has enough. God wants to give you guys these things. His cup literally overflows for us. And I think that he can give way more than we can imagine. But when we doubt, we're limiting that aspect of God. We're limiting what he can do for us. And the literal meaning of without reproach means um, without showing your teeth. Um, and it'd be an interesting thing if God was like, here you go. <laughs> right? It's a little bit mean. But God's not like that. Um, another way that we can think about it is like, you probably know someone who has given you a gift, but maybe there's a motive behind it. You guys know someone like that? Um, if you don't, maybe think back to when you were a child and you had a brother or sister, and then you'll find that person. <laughs> my sister always gave me things, not for my birthday, not for Christmas, just like during the middle of the week. It was a Wednesday. And she would give me something, and she's like, oh, like, I want you to have it. And she's five years older than me, so she was a lot smarter than I was. She knew that I would think it was cool because she once had it, and she thought it was cool. So I would keep it in my room, and she would have more storage space. And this happened because my mom hated the pack rat side of my sister. She kept everything. And um, one thing in particular that sticks out of my head is those, those little like 90s trolls with the, with the hair. <laughs> The, like neon hair, green, you know, man. those things were pointless. <laughs> Why did I want those? She sold me on them, and I became her storage unit. <laughs> I've since learned, but we all know these people, and God is not like those people. God doesn't have an agenda when he's giving you something. He's giving it generously, liberally. He's giving it without reproach. There's no teeth shown in his giving. It just happens because he wants to. So God isn't like that, like us, because he's a cheerful giver. Uh, Psalms 23 says it in another way. His, um, 
He leads us through paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's giving to then further glorify his world and his name. I think often he wants to lead us more than we actually desire a leader. We want to be our own leader and take us where we want to go. It doesn't work. And it makes sense that God gives to us generously, doesn't it? If we honestly believe in the Trinity, then he was content in perfect love for others before he ever created us. He created out of nothing, not because he needed to, not because he wanted something out of it or out of us, not because he wanted something back. He created joyously and said it was good. Creating and giving is good to God. He likes it. It's pleasurable. And the second that we had the chance, we turned. Because we're not like him. We became double-minded. We had a hard time making decisions. Starting at the tree. We ultimately forced God then to make the decision for us because we failed him. Now he must choose the ultimate decision in sacrificing his son. I'd like to invite you, if you haven't already, to choose Jesus today. It's not a decision that is taken lightly, but it's a decision worth doing. If you're struggling something uh, with something right now, maybe it's school, your future, a loved one, being single, being married, alcohol or drug abuse, those decisions will become clear if you ask God wholeheartedly for the wisdom to sort those decisions out. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying being a Christian is easy. I'm not saying that your decisions will all of a sudden become perfectly clear. But you have a partner in making them. You have someone who you can lean on to gain understanding in a giant 66 book Bible full, chock full of life wisdom. He hasn't left us resourceless. Matthew 6, 26, it says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, they do not reap or gather into barns, yet the heavenly Father feeds them. Are we not much more valuable than they? And Luke 11 says it like this, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you who are so evil know how to give good gifts to children, how much more will your Father in heaven give to those who ask? If you honestly believe that our Lord in heaven is a good Father, then why don't we believe he's going to give us the wisdom that we seek for? Ask with belief. Up to this part, everything's been kind of pretty lofty, excuse the pun, and it might seem vague, and the, uh, the teacher, theologian in me wants to give you like a five-step plan on how to do this practically, but I don't think I can. I mean, I, I could give you my approach, but I don't think it would be beneficial. And I don't think it's what the text asks me to do. It says one thing, just ask. It's that simple. Just ask. Don't hesitate. Don't be double-minded. Just ask and ask with honesty. Go to him like you would to any other loving father. Be real, be vulnerable, be you, and ask with your whole heart. Let's pray. Father, we know that you desire the best things for us. And it's so hard to see that sometimes, Lord. It's so easy to get wrapped up with what's going on right in front of us. It's so easy to want me first. I want to do what I want to do. But Lord, if 
I believe in your word. I know that you desire good for me. And that if my desire is simply matched up with yours, I would gain what I'm seeking for, honestly, what I'm seeking for. Lord, I ask that you give us the wisdom we seek for. You give us what we truly desire, that our desires match yours. We love you. We thank you for your son.